Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, quick background. I'm a Canadian. I'm uh, from Montreal, so that explains the accent. And I've, been, uh, work, I've worked in the past in this city for a few years, so it's good to be back. Uh, but I've spent the last 11 years in Europe, and the last two of these have been at Guard Time. And Guard Time is a company that's uh, doing blockchain. I'll put it in quotes because it's uh, not your typical Bitcoin stuff. It's a different approach uh, using similar technologies uh, to do data and process integrity. And a few years ago, they decided to uh, start up a new business line on cyber ranges and cyber exercises. And I was hired to lead that part. Uh, so I won't talk about blockchain stuff. If you're interested in that, let me know. I'm going to talk to you about cyber exercises and specifically about improving preparedness. And I think a lot of people think about exercises a lot as training, individual training. Uh, I'll show you some example of where this uh, comes a little bit to be a much wider scope and much more interesting and much more important. And, you know, I'm preaching to the choir here, so I don't need to go into any details why this is important. It's not a matter of if you will get hacked, it's when you will get hacked, and the big thing will be how you react. And how you react is not an individual uh, heroic moment. It's a team, it's a de department, it's a group of people that will work together in handling this situation. And that's a lot of teamwork. That's a lot of teamwork under pressure for things you didn't think about. A lot of people stressed and asking hard questions. And until you've lived it, you don't really know how well you'll do. So uh, we've been establishing this program of cyber exercises to improve preparedness, to be ready when the moment comes, when you have a major breach, and then you have to do the investigation and handle all, all the different aspects uh, that comes with a large uh, security compromise at your organization. And I'll explain to you a little bit of, uh, of how, uh, how this is going uh, for us. So you had a big party last night, so I thought that I would keep this lightweight. It's a simple talk. None of this technical googly gook is going to come up on the screen, all right? I broke it down in three parts, theory, practice, and then takeaway. So I'll do, we'll do the dry stuff first, and then you can see the fun stuff after. I said this already. Exercises can be very, very different. This picture shows you a bunch of different exercises from uh, across the world. Uh, people do them for different reasons. And when you mention ex exercise, everybody's got like some kind of preconceived idea. But it's pretty broad set of different kinds of activities, and the details do matter. So I want to walk you through what we do, and what we do are custom cyber exercises. So they're really built to meet specific needs of the client. And this is the life cycle. So when we start, we call this the initiation phase, when a client says, we'd like to get an exercise, and then we start talking about what kind of exercise, what are the dates, set of budgets, and some time frame. And then once that's agreed and we get a contract, we start defining the exercise. And that's a long, can be a long process if they don't know what they want. And I'll go through with the, the uh, kind of information we decide upon when we're trying to define the exercise. And once that's kind of agreed, we start the development phase. And then we start to build all of the custom elements of the exercise to make sure that, uh, that we meet the client's needs. And then we start the execution phase. And for our exercises, uh, they're quite realistic, usually on cyber ranges. And then there's a long phase uh, of testing, deployment, making sure everything works. And then there's a phase of seeding that starts where the simulation starts. It will run for a few days, a few weeks beforehand. And then the exercise participants arrive on site. And then they start the exercise. And then they play it out. And most people forget to do phase four, the analysis, which is really important. You've got to keep enough um, effort left in, in, in the budget. You've got to leave enough time to analyze what happened during the exercise. How well did we do on this? How well did we do on that? And then come up with improvements. Some of the key aspects. So the purpose of an exercise. And we, we put that in five categories. You can have an exercise to demonstrate something to, to you know, executives or people, uh, stakeholders. You can have an exercise to practice skills that you already know. You can have an exercise to train, that is to learn new skills. And you can assess the be people against certain uh, criteria. And you can certify and issue certifications, you know, being qualified for something. Some exercise combine a bit in both. You know, you always usually learn something new when you practice something. And you often practice what you learn in a training exercise. So it's a little bit of a mix. But it's important for you to know exactly what's the purpose. And then you have objectives. Usually we have four or five high-level ones, and then as we start to do the definition, we'll go down in depth. 
And these can be, okay, practice uh, incident handling, communications to management, uh, malware reverse engineering. And then as we get down in the details uh, through the development process, we might say on this set of tools for this kind of malware, for example. And so they get a little bit more detail at a later stage. And then we have the participants. Who is going to play in the exercise? And then you usually have a set of people that you want to um, train or practice, exercise or assess. And then you have the scenario that will come and then you're gonna decide whether you include additional people because they would be involved if these situations happened or if you're gonna role play them uh, during the exercise. And when you role play, you can do it with exercise controllers or you can do it with the real people that have those jobs. They're aware of the scenario, they know what's gonna happen, but they still play their part and they challenge you know, the, with the participants, the players, uh, in doing their thing. So you have to decide who's going to be in the game and uh, receiving the exercise and who's gonna be involved as a role player. You also gotta look at the scope. So what kind of systems, what are the entities that are gonna be involved, what organizations are there. And we, when you start to make a bigger, bigger cyber crisis, then there's more and more people involved, law enforcement, government departments, other industry partners, where do you stop? So when we get into the development phase, we actually control this scope and we scope in, scope out, review the objectives and adjust everything as we go along. And then you come up with a, a scenario. So our exercises aren't technical training. There's a story, always a story behind a situation that comes up. So there's a background and we could use real or fictitious entities, so we could use the world as it is, but maybe you don't want to say this nation state attacked us. Politically, that could be sensitive. So then you create a fake nation, you put it in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, and then you give it a name and people, and then you start playing with that. And there's your threat actors, who are going to do the attacks? And this is really important for us because this is the whole coherence of the storyline of the scenario that really needs to make sense. So it's easy to say, let's train on malware and then this kind of malware, but then you need a story. How did this malware get there and why? And often we begin developing and people have ideas. We could do this, we could do that, we could do that. And all of this is beautiful, but then we take a step back and we ask ourselves, why would the threat actor do that? That doesn't make sense at the technical level or at the operational level. So then we revalidate and say, okay, we can't do it there because they would never do this if they're a nation state with you know, the desire to do an intelligence activity, then they're not going to break a system or cause something that will get them noticed. Or if they're to, there to do damage, they wouldn't do this, they wouldn't do that. So we have to create coherency at the threat actor level. And then we have this road to crisis. So a bunch of elements that will lead up the tensions and explain uh, uh, the situation at the moment of the start of the exercise. And during the exercise, we define what are called storylines. These are sequences of events that will either aim to achieve one of the objectives or focus on one aspect of the exercise. And we appoint people to take care of these events and make sure that they're thought through when will everything happen. And then we have mod modalities of the exercise. And this is where you know, the world of exercises comes in and blows up into so many options you can do. So you can have, in terms of the exercise environment, real systems, the computer system that you're using now. Rarely done because these are production grade system, you could break them, so you have to be careful. You could have a simulated system, so you replicate the real world on a cyber range. This is what we do most often very difficult to make the real world the replica of it. So you always uh, you know, have some part of it that's implemented and other things are not there. You can have it as a tabletop, simply talking about things, having seniors around the table, for example, and saying, this is the email you receive, what do you do? Or you can combine all these things and have elements of, of, of all of those. You have the degree of involvement. You can be anything from a kind of interactive briefing where you're asking the people to say, what would you do now? Oh, okay, if that's your decision, then this is what would happen next. What do you do now? All the way to having the people sitting down and doing the hands-on work. Yes? Let's do them during, but let's keep them very fast. So a tabletop is, a, is that there's no computer systems. So basically you print material and you just hand over, this has happened, this, you know, so it's basically just around a table without any computer systems. Good so far, okay. So yeah, you can be all hands on playing their roles. So that would be really extreme degree of involvement, which is the one that uh, we prefer. 
Uh, you can have an exercise that uh, is held in one place. All the participants have to come there, or you could distribute it over multiple sites. Uh, you can have scenario events that are pre-recorded, so you can actually play them in the systems when they're happening, or you could actually do them live, which is what we prefer. And actually, this is also where, so far for our exercises, we've hired Rigel Kent and Mike to be our red team, and they've done all the attacks live, because when they're on site and the participants are reacting in a different way, we can put more pressure or put less pressure. We can adjust to the reaction of the participants. Makes a better exercise. And then you have the tools, techniques, and procedures. And this gets complicated. And this I'm talking about the usually, let's say, a blue team exercise, meaning a defensive exercise. What tools are they going to use? And there, um, it's best to use the tools that they're using on a daily basis. But this could be licensed software. Uh, this could be something, if you have a crowd coming from different organizations, could be very different. So then you have to pick a middle ground, some kind of software, put it in place, and then they're going to practice. When we talk about communications, uh, I used to do um, exercises in NATO. They always wanted to test the actual communications because they would find out that their phone number lists are out of date. So in the exercise, they need to call this person, they ring the number, no one picks up, phone number is dead. So if we gave them fake phones, which we do in some exercises, they wouldn't have validated that their real means of communications function. So you have to decide which way it's going to go and what you're going to do. We have uh, also the possibility to introduce new tools that don't exist, that they don't have now. And we do it to demonstrate how those tools would help them do some of the work they're typically asked to do. And these convenience TTPs, they're tools that there's the common denominator, like open source software, which we use a lot because all of our participants have different things anyway, so let's just use what's commonly available and put that there. And that speaks to the communications, whether it's real or simulated. So we've done exercises where we've provide them, provided them, did I press the wrong button? There we go. Uh, provided them with mobile phones. They've been able to make phone calls on this. Uh, and, and in some cases, it was all simulated uh, aspects. All right, so those are the modalities. So this is kind of your multi-part question, I guess. Um, on, the, on the exercise <coughs> scenario like this, you, are you basically looking at everything at the same time, or you break it down to uh, basically like look at certain aspects of how the organization would react in a certain way. So for example, are you just trying to collect metrics and information on how the So it depends, it varies. That's client need, that's the discussion in the definition, and we take it over as well in the development. When we develop, we, we do the spiral process, we might revisit. So in some cases, we've done very full-featured exercises. Most of them are. Uh, say full-featured, it's never full-full. Uh, but we do look at what we're scheduling. So we take every individual we have, we uh, get them to answer a survey, we know their skill sets, we match them in teams that balance the skill set, and then we look at the exercise objectives, and then we are going to lay essentially tasks. We call them injects. This is what we're feeding them. They're going to work on this. We estimate it'll take them two hours, and this is what they're going to give it them back to us. And then we're going to schedule their time and be very careful about not overloading them. But whether they do this type of work or that, that type of work, that's all part of the design. It depends what the client wants. Most often, we've looked at many of the aspects of reporting, and they've been have to do many things at the same time. Some people looking at one attack, the other looking at a different attack, another one preparing a, a briefing for management. But focus is important. I have it on another slide. That's all the art of designing the exercise. Because, of course, if you create a situation where everybody's super busy on everything and they lose, you know, they don't know what's going on anymore, they lose the value. So you have to be careful. Very quickly. Uh, so, so you said you hired uh, like, like Mike, yeah. like as a hot, uh, hot blade Super hot. to go through systems. And but you also talked about interactions with NATO, and, and is it that your group will do Talon COE style uh, activities uh, where, where you, you can also do offshore activities in areas uh, with sort of <coughs> So you mean that the attacks would come from the internet or that we would take the exercise? Well, I mean, there are the legal frameworks you know, in place with respect to the community in Canada. But you also do 
disrupt uh, elsewhere? Where yeah. Okay. Well, we haven't done operations in Canada yet. We've done operations in Estonia and Switzerland. We're going to the UK very soon. We could go anywhere. We travel anywhere to bring the exercise. Yeah. Okay. So this, I spoke about this spiral development. There's many aspects of an exercise. You've got this purpose, the objective, the participants, the scope, the scenario, the modalities, and the environment. We go to the, the client, we say, this is what you can do. And things start to shape up. And we appoint a, a core planning team with stakeholders from the, the, uh, the client. And they're going, oh, I'd like to do this, I'd like to do that. And we think about it. We go and do some work, come back with them with a scenario and say, okay, this could be the attacker, here's your threat actor, this is what they would be intent on doing, and they come back, oh no, that's politically not good. Okay, so we tweak that, and then we say, well, if we include this, then we need this equipment, can you supply the equipment? No, okay, well, let's move on to something else. And we play with that to do all of these, uh, these, uh, these aspects and finalize what it is, and that's the development uh, portion. And after a while, you, you, it, you know, an exercise is kind of like a brick wall on the highway, it's coming at you. And uh, the, the good thing and the bad thing about it is that, uh, well, the bad thing is that you've got this deadline, people are going to show up, and you're going to have to deliver, and if you're not ready, you're in big trouble. And the good thing is it's got a deadline, and when it happens, it will be over. So it's not this project that will last forever in your life, you get it done with. But uh, you have to know how to schedule things, that's really important, because there's a lot of different aspects, and you've got to bring in a bazillion things into a cohesive thing, experience that gets delivered. So we, we uh, use some uh, automation software, and we're building this. Essentially, this is also the product that uh, we want to sell. Uh, this is a, a tool that allows us to drag and drop all of the virtual machines and the assets that we have and plan the scenario out, and then click on a button and deploy it on a cyber range, and everything gets built automatically. This is uh, something that's in the works that we've been building over the years that we continue to build, and that really helps us to uh, speed up the development process and the automation for creating very complex exercises. So, a couple of consideration. You gotta understand the complexity of what you're doing and you gotta control it according to this uh, schedule and then you gotta know at what point you're starting to be late and then get back to the client and say, you need to decide on this scenario, I need your threat actor, I need to know if this is in, if this is out, I need the participant list and all of these things so that you're sure that you don't actually um, arrive at the moment of the exercise completely not ready or some things uh, not, uh, not uh, well thought through. Now that's an art, and we've arrived at exercises with a lot of things that were not uh, well thought through, but we managed. Yes? I can. I think I can. I can. Oh yeah, pictures are good. Yeah, but not everything in the slides. Yeah, the slides will be, there's videos. I can't give the videos out. All right, so all of this complexity, you have to understand it, control it, you have to know, you know, your pace and development. If you go too quickly and you develop something and you start to build it, and then later on the client comes back and says, yeah, we can't do that. You've wasted your time. Now you're closer to execution, you've spent a lot of effort, now you have less time to react. So, you know, getting the feeling from the client, does he really know what he wants or not, and is he gonna change his mind, and all of this is really enough. Yeah. Sorry, I it's all good. Um, so you know, before all this stuff comes into fruition and you actually get signed up with client thing, um, I'm sure there's a lot of people sitting here that you know know that this is a good idea. But similar to like a PR type thing, right? Um, but what would you say would be uh, key takeaway points for us to all go back to our respective organizations and put forward a pitch to the executive level to say we should have this, we need this. They're dealing with you know budget constraints. Yep. You know, you got one team saying, oh, we need this, we need to build well. You got another team saying that they, but how would we sell this to you <coughs> say, this is something that we as a company need to invest in, yep. and here are the benefits. What, what sort of- It's preparedness is, is the key thing, resilience. You're gonna get hacked, okay, maybe not, but you can't say that it, it will never, we invest in protection and we'll be protected. You need to invest in defense. And that protection will give you those barrier defenses. Once those are breached, you react, and you invest in defense, detection, reaction, and all that. You've got incident handling tool. But do you know if it works? You don't know if it works. Unless you've got a big incident and you've went through it, then you'll know if, that it works. If you haven't had an incident and you think you might get one, then practice. How big the exercise is, well, consult. You ask and you say, well, you know, we have this budget, what can we get? 
and then you can then see if that's okay and, and move forward. There's individual training, but once you've got individuals trained, they need to work as a team, and then you need to engage the senior uh, executives into a crisis, and all that is best done under an exercise, where there's a common scenario you've thought through, where you are in your organization, what lessons do you need, what things do you need to validate. So it's about preparedness, being prepared, due diligence. And how much to put? Well, you know, we don't have an answer for that. There's cheap exercises, there's expensive exercises. One of the things you have to remember, though, if you're going to like schedule an exercise six months from now, and then you plan for it, and then you run it, and then you analyze the results, that's going to be what you're going to do for the next nine months in terms of exercising in your organization. And the world moves on. If that exercise is small and it's meaningless, you might have spent only so much money, but you've wasted that time. Now you're going to say, I need the next exercise, which is nine months later until you, you learn those lessons. So you're like a year and a half later. So the budget has to be thought about not just how much this costs, but the, the fact that this is what you're investing for the next nine months, and nothing else in terms of practicing and being prepared. So I realize you have problems and variations depending on your customer and engagements, yeah. but would, would it be possible for you to say what a reasonably median engagement in terms of the roles that you would see provided by your customers to, to engage and how much vary? You're talking about price. Yeah, if you were going to run a session. This is so complex depending on you know, how you bring it together. Ask me after and I'll give you some information on the past. But you should see the next slide to understand what we're talking about. Okay, I want to, yeah. If I could just throw in a, a kind of a, to answer part of Mike's question there. So, <coughs> so it, 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 uh, my, my team has worked with uh, Luke and our time on a number of exercises on, on the red team side. Uh, kind of in comparison to Kind of classroom training, the, the exercise gives like a typical red team, blue team uh, kind of exercise. Uh, this, uh, the exercises give the blue teams the opportunity to participate facing live fire. It's not like a classroom situation where you have a, a staged instrument with data that is staged and it's static, it's not changing. This is an environment that is changing. Uh, certainly, as we've mentioned, uh, activities are scheduled in, in, in what's called the weasel. But if the blue team starts basically fighting back with the red team, then the red team starts fighting back with the blue team. So things become very dynamic and, and far more realistic at, at that point. And in my opinion, provides a, a lot more uh, realistic uh, kind of training environment. You're, you're acting under a lot of fire at, at that point. So, so. And, and this ability to adjust, I mean, you might schedule this and you might not realize that the people that are coming have this level of, you might have not have a mismatch with the skill set. And when you're doing it live, you can adjust. We have, to, we have like sent people into the room saying, okay, you guys are not getting this. Here's how it works. And then we've walked them through, this is what you need to look at. And then you're really adapting the training specifically to the needs. The other thing that's really important is that you're having a social event. We have an icebreaker, we have an evening out, we have people that are coming from different parts of, of different organizations, meeting each other for the first time, having to work under pressure as a team, and then they, they call each other out. So we've done this like sector-wide kind of exercises, and people come back and say, you know, I know my, my professional network has, has really increased a lot, and, and the, this is a true benefit for many organizations. Regarding cost, I'll tell you that I think we did a bit of math on this, and it's not more expensive than a SANS course per person. Okay, so, but it has a different value, that's for sure. I'll go quickly now because I don't want to run out of time for the, for the videos. That's the fun part. So uh, focus uh, the exercise so you can get carried away with many things happening. You got to establish certain focal points, you got to schedule them in time, and you got to say that at this moment, this is what they'll work on, and then at this moment, that's what they will, will work on. And I don't know why the laptop goes to, yeah, sleep or something. Uh, you need to plan everything. You need to schedule your development. You need to know where you are in the planning cycle and how much time you've got left. And you need to work and inform the stakeholders. You need to tell them what you're going to do because at some point they might actually say, no, you can't do that or that's not realistic. And if they tell you too late, then you're out of time. And then we have this concept of exercise controllers, these uh, people that will actually help you uh, deliver the exercise. And you've got to get those guys to be close to the participants, to understand what does the person do on a daily basis that you're training. What are the tool sets? What are the practices? What is the regulatory framework? Are there any reporting requirements? And then you've got to get that into uh, the scenario so that it's realistic. 
Um, when you're building storylines, we've all, I've done an exercise where people started crying because everything fell apart. Uh, we made something that was dependent on something else that was dependent on something else. And when that thing didn't happen, then everything just didn't happen. And you've worked for months and you just can't deliver your thing. Everybody's disappointed. So understanding dependencies of events, and this was an exercise in NATO where we actually did massive uh, cyber range activity at the same time as the crisis management uh, exercise was happening, which is the, where the North Atlantic Council meets. So this is, you know, minister level. And they're trying to handle the crisis and we're feeding them the cyber elements and synchronizing the top level executive at minister level and the techie guys doing, you know, packet capture into something that works in a two day time frame was a significant challenge. It was very difficult, but it has to be done. So, but these are dependencies that can uh, uh, cause your exercise to fail. You gotta have a backup if things that you're depending upon don't happen. Uh, we found it very useful to invest in the scenario. A lot of exercises are technical, do this, then do that. We build a story. It's a Hollywood movie and you're in it, you're the star. And that really has worked because it's very boring to, to peak up and reverse engineering all day until there is like a news story that comes up and you're like, whoa, that's my organization being hacked in the news. You, j you just get a completely different feeling. You get into it and then it really becomes interesting. And then uh, realistic event, I talked about the threat actor needing to be coherent. That needs to be at the operational level. Why would they do that if that's what their miss mission is? And what tools and techniques do they use? And it needs to be customized and it needs to target specifically the skill sets and roles of every participants. Uh, when you're running it, you need to monitor closely. I've been at an exercise uh, organized by somebody else uh, for a central bank uh, a few years ago. And at some point they were expecting somebody to do something. That person didn't believe in the scenario. So he said, I'm not doing it. He was pretty senior. And they kind of said, well, let's wait and see. And that was a big mistake because the longer they waited, the less he wanted to do it, the more the dependent things weren't going to happen. And then that whole part just fell, fell out of the exercise. And that was significant. So if something's not happening, you got to step in and correct it. And we have all sorts of tools and techniques to bring the participants back on track. And the thing with an exercise is not like a training. A training, you've got, you're the master of the classroom. You're feeding them this. You say, do this, then do that, then do this. You're in control. You're not in control of an exercise. The participants, they are going to do whatever they want and they're going to surprise you. And you got to be ready if they're going to go do that. You didn't expect it to find some artifice, artificial thing to bring them back on track uh, in a reasonable way. And if you're dealing with senior ex executives, they're not trained in the same way as a technical person. You have to be careful with them and they have busy uh, schedules. So when they walk in, it's got to be ready. It's got to go. It's got to be meaningful. It's got to be at their level. And after you've done this, well, we do hot wash and you talked about, um, you know, whether we run this in one, uh, one stretch or not. We've done exercises where it continues until the end. And then at the end, we have a debrief. We've done exercises more recently with Mike, where Mike comes in at the end of the day and says, okay, today, this is what we did to you. And this is what you should have seen. This is where you need to be. And then the next day we continue from that point on. You decide, you know, as you create the exercise, which design approach you will take. But we do this hot watch either daily or immediately after uh, the last day. And then we do a debrief, you know, on the last day where we explain exactly, here's the threat actor. This is what they did. This is where you could have seen them. This is where you didn't see them. And that's what you could have picked up. And we provide a full scenario. And then you make a report and you talk about how well this, did the planning of this exercise do and uh, go and how can we improve future exercises? And then you make a separate report about how they performed and how could they improve their performance operationally. Any questions on the theory? Because we're going to get into the practical part. Yes. Um, what will be the, you just mentioned that sometimes it's like a movie and you're in the movie. How, what, what will be the most, um, uh, in the scenario, what will be the most thing that you should focus on to keep people engaged so they forget that it's an exercise and that could be real life. So two things I would, well, just if I'm gonna say one thing, it's realism and, and that it's meaningful to their role. So you need to understand who that person is and what do they do on a daily basis and deliver an experience close to home for them, something that's meaningful. If the exercise is bringing a diverse set of people, then it's technical and operational realism. 
and some challenging things, you know, no boring moments, diversity, this will get them engaged. Okay, I'm gonna to talk to you about these exercises that we did. So we got some contracts uh, through the Ministry of Defense of Estonia uh, for the UK. Uh, first, the civil nuclear sector, we delivered them a custom exercise in February 2018. Then we did the, a gas exercise, and then we did the same exercise again for a different crowd of people. Um, so this is all custom made. Uh, the first time they came, they didn't know what they wanted, so they said, well, we'll take whatever you've got. And then we said, well, that doesn't work this way, so we created something custom, engaged them. But we really didn't have a lot of time. We had three months to, to get this done, so it was pretty hard to do it. Uh, but uh, it worked out very well. I'll combine both exercises together. So overall, we had like 18 participants on average from 12 different organizations from the civil nuclear sector in the UK. They all flew into Estonia with many, many observers. There were like 30 people in our offices. And then we uh, built this exercise environment and we simulated the nuclear power plant. And that simulation, you know, I talk about realism, but it only takes a little bit of it to make it good enough for the exercise because of course we're not going to make a nuclear power plant. Our nuclear power plant operated with 20 users, for example. But having 20 workstations for the red team to attack and these guys to defend, is a whole lot. They can't even get enough visibility in the speed of the exercise and they get enough training with this. You don't have to go bigger than that. So it was very much fake. We did hire a company to uh, consult. So the domain knowledge we don't have. We master orchestrating the exercise and then the client comes and whatever the domain is, we contract out, bring in an expert and then we talk about how does it work, cybersecurity and nuclear power plant. And we said, can we do this? No, no, that's not how it works. And this is da, 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 da. And then we worked something custom with the expert. In this scenario, we had physical access control, video surveillance of the inside of the, some parts of the system on the outside. We had one simulated nuclear reactor, basically a little SCSI system, a SCADA system that we, uh, we simulated the cooling of the reactor and a, you know, a HMI display with a reactor and it's cooling. And we had a simulated backup generator. On the first case, it was in Germany. We had a VPN to Germany. And that actually was the generator, if you know about the Aurora vulnerability, that was this uh, released by DHS, I think, many, many years ago. You basically, this, the way the system is built, if you change the cycle of the generator, it actually kicks when, uh, when you do that. And then you can kick it so much that it just explodes and breaks down. So we exploited that vulnerability uh, through the simulation and they could, uh, they could actually see the way, the same way that the system works. It was a, a copy of the code, I guess. And we had two threat actors and one insider. One threat actor was stealing credit card information, was a diversion. The point was, can they distinguish between the other one and this one, the other one being a nation state who wanted to discredit the nuclear industry by causing the reactor to scram. And basically that's what they did. They shut the cooling pump down and uh, they destroyed the backup generator. And when they shut the cooling pump down, the safety system triggered and the, the reactor scrammed. So that was the scenario, much more to it. Did I miss anything, Mike? Uh, no, I, I guess I'll mention that. Uh, so not only were there attacks against the uh, IT systems, but we also did attacks against the physical access controls and the video surveillance system. That was part of the simulation. Uh, of the APT, so it, it, nothing was unrealistic. So it, everything was realistic and generated real data for the blue teams to see in both IT systems, physical access controls, and, and video control systems. Yeah, and we bought real hardware. Okay, maybe that's not the one they use in the nuclear power plant, but we had these card swipes, and then when you would swipe, the card would send a signal. So we had the card swipe, and we swiped a couple of times to show people moving in the rooms. We had a fake diagram of where the rooms were. And then these guys got into that system and put in a new key card and changed the access rules. So now an insider with his card could go into a room he's not allowed to. And in the end, this insider placed this Raspberry Pi device with a Wi-Fi antenna onto the ICS system, which was, of course, disconnected. And we built everything up. So there were attacks. There was RDP servers. I think I have the, yeah, this is the crazy network diagram. So this times many times, as many teams as you've got. We, I'm not going to go through it, but uh, I have a laser, so I want to use it. <laughs> okay, so there was the SOC team, an office zone, some servers, physical security with the cameras and, uh, and the zone access control thing. 
We had jump servers, so you would only be able to RDP here, and if you are, were there, open a session and then go and see the, the, the real uh, bass control system and the uh, PLCs to control the cooling. And then you, uh, you had other systems to simulate the internet here. Pretty complex in the end to put and deploy and test, yes. So, yeah, what tool do you that system? so we deploy, and this was a Windows environment, so we install a, in virtual machines complete systems of Windows, a domain controller. We uh, create list of users, create the users, and have people uh, sitting at the keyboard simulating things, and as well as scripts that are sending emails and surfing. So the IT environment feels like a populated office environment, Windows domain. For the ICS, actually, the UK provided a uh, little Siemens device that we physically connected to the cyber range and then wrote code to simulate a cooling pump, very basic. Again, the realism there is not something significant. It's something very small, very basic, but that's very important to do. And this is what we do when we develop the exercise. We build all those systems, we run tests, and when they're correct, we, then we start the seeding, we start to do the attacks before the exercise. When they walk in, the systems are compromised, and they already start to work. I'm uh, just looking at time. Uh, you're asking the questions in, uh, as we go along, so I think we're okay. We do have a coffee break after this, so if you go over time, okay. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't want to pull coffee because we need to see the video. Okay. Yeah, you do. You do. So uh, that was the big setup that we had. It's pretty complicated to build, pretty uh, sophisticated stuff. I just want to show you how we control the scenario, and this is a, I didn't have a network connection here. This is a presentation of the events that we plan and at the time that they're scheduled to happen. And we do this planning and this is just a subset. Usually we will have like 500 entry in this and you can like kind of scroll through and see what's gonna happen and we give a briefing. So we say, okay, this is the plan. They're gonna do this, then this is gonna happen, then this is gonna happen, then this is gonna happen. And we use these tools to kind of look over time. Okay, how much stuff are we throwing at these guys? And then individually we look and we say, okay, what is this person receiving? in terms of emails, injects, requests for works, and is he going to be busy? How long is that going to take? And then, you know, we just make sure that they don't, they're not overloaded. And that's the participants. Then we have to look at the red team. And the red team needs to do this and that and do all that, and do they have time? And in this exercise, <laughs> we made some mistakes. So this goes really fast, and things you, you just got to, you know, plan, and then we have videos, I'll show you. We filmed them before and we have to play them. So in the end, we actually didn't think things through. We filmed the sequences and then we're like ready to go. And we start the exercise, we're doing the last minute syncing, and we say, oh my God, we like the video, there's only 20 seconds to do this. And then, you know, the, the red team's gotta go in, do a bunch of stuff in 20 seconds, and therefore it's gonna take them five minutes, so they have to start five minutes sooner. We don't know when that is, and so it becomes a real inter interesting thing. Quick comment on that. So, as a red team, okay, given the time constraints, uh, we have to prepare our access. Like, uh, as, as you'll see in the diagram that Luke put up, uh, not only are we you know, having bits and pieces of real environment, but there's zoning there too. So, for example, in order for us to have got to the to get to the physical access controls, we have to go through a trusted workstation that can connect to the firewall to the jump server. So, in order to actually meet the 20 second interval to get to the proper trigger and scheduling, we have to set ourselves up our proxies and redirectors and stuff in advance, and they basically sit there, you know, hands on keyboard, ready to go, and then we hear from uh, Luke or one of Luke's team say go, and then we, and we just hope and pray that the blue teams don't see our access and shut us in at that time. That's where things get very And, and you, you, you know, Mike, being a pretty relaxed guy pretty much all the time, but I've seen Mike looking at his keyboard and like, okay, is it, you know? Really being ready, yeah, very quickly. So I guess that's a good question, is that how do you actually measure the threat actor component? I mean, this is a very high level, sophisticated, probably nation state type of action, right? Yeah. So how do you actually build grades down below that? Because we're not going to always see that. No. There's only so many places in the world, right? So yeah. For good or bad. For good or bad. So how, how are you actually balancing the rules of engagement that way? Say, so, okay, Mike, you said, you can't go beyond this because this is not the case. Well, well, that's one of the key things. I'm glad you asked that. So, so many exercises are blue against red, and red just goes crazy. They do whatever it takes, and then this stuff just becomes like a whack-a-mole kind of game. And then if there's scoring, then people, it's 
I don't want to be offensive or anything. It's like the Olympics, you know, you got to get drugged and not get caught kind of thing to win. So the, the point is, is, uh, is that the, the red and blue stuff, they, they, they don't practice cyber defense. They practice winning that scoring algorithm. So in our case, the red team is completely under our control. We work with the client beforehand to say, what's your threat actor? And then we define that. And as we plan the exercise, we see the threat actor is going to do that. And they say, nah, that's not likely to happen, you know, too sophisticated. That's not what we want to practice for. We want to practice this. And then we change it. So it's a discussion with the client. The client will say, this is what we want. And we work with them because it's not easy to do. At the end of the day, though, we've all agreed that this is the scope of capabilities that they have. And this is their strategic intent. Therefore, that's what they're going to do. And we'll work it out. It's a discussion. It's custom. So to Mike's scenario there where he's got that 20 second window, um, and for the purpose of you know, moving the exercise forward, if you hadn't have gotten in with your 20 second window, uh, did you have factored in uh, to the power of exercise magic, <laughs> you did get in, right? Like, I mean, it wouldn't have yeah. been slight on you guys, but yeah, it, no, just, no, no. Yeah. it just didn't happen, it didn't happen, but that probably would have pushed back a whole bunch of other uh, reactions right. and, and opportunities. So, so just just to you know, full disclosure, I'm happy when the blue team finds us. So that means right. that uh, they're 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 learning something in that. Um, that that's where I, I think things get kind of creative and you know, yeah. pushing things are kind of I'll, I'll let Luke comment on that. Yeah, I mean we we work it out. Uh, yeah, ultimately, the objective is for them to win, at least learn something, and they can at some point shut them completely out. And at some point, it's not happened. We've always managed to keep it in control and keep it along the plan we had made. But if the plan goes wrong, it's an exercise. We walk in the room and say, guys, this happened, this failed, or you did too well. We're going to like reset here. Now we're back on track. We can just do that. It's very easy. So we do news, uh, like I'm looking at this little you know, yellow color here. We do news things. And the news is there to, to put them in perspective. So I'll play this. and. Uh, this is an example of a newscast we did. And, and this was for the nuclear exercise. The EU and WTO drag on. Some good news on the financial markets as the pound gains on the US dollar. But first, to our top story, renewed cyber attacks against the Skidness nuclear power plant. What are the ramifications of this? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm I, Ryan Peatley. This is one of the really well-known well and famous uh, Estonian actors. So when people in Estonia saw this news, they were like, oh my god, you hired the you know, top actor. Behind them, and if they are not stopped to be able, able to move your mouth, what damage can we expect to see? When it gets to this point, can you Some click to bring it? Some of will we'll remember that, that the Skegness nuclear power plant on the Lincolnshire coast was the target of cyber attacks a few months ago. During those attacks, Crippling ransomware was planted by criminals on the plant's computer system. I'm just going to move it forward, so if you can take it to over here now. The Nuclear Power Corporation just click and, yeah, from the Association Thanks. of Nuclear Scientists. Good afternoon, Dr. Fascherback. Good afternoon. Can you please describe to us so this the is an expert. these attacks? Yes, of course. Um, but I think it's important, first of all, to, to, to mention that these are just initial reports from the Signet. As more information becomes available from the Nuclear Power Corporation and the government, so, uh, the picture will become much clearer. In this case, the, the guys, they barely started. And the enemy who's breaking in is the one who released the information and leaked it. That's the part of the scenario, because they want this credit of the nuclear industry. Control systems of the nuclear reactor. Now, this is serious. Um, it means that these attacks are much more dangerous than the previous ones experienced at the plant several years ago. What are the possible consequences? Well, it's not clear whether uh, the attackers can actually control the reactors. So, this is what the news do to you. The guy's saying that things are safe, don't worry, but the images are completely different. The Nuclear Power Corporation has designed its computer systems uh, properly. Uh, it shouldn't be possible for a cyber attack to affect the safety of any radioactive material. But we don't know. And we don't know very much about the situation at the site either. So anyways, this news goes on. I'll skip forward because the other videos are a bit better. Uh, so this news thing sets the piece. And when this played, the guys didn't even barely knew they were broken into. And what he's saying that they've reached into the control system, they weren't aware and everything. At the end of the first day, they end up disconnecting uh, the connections between the control, the IT systems that they use, this RDP jump server, 
and the ICS feeling protected. The next day uh, starts, uh, they're happy about this level of disconnection operating on manual controls, and we invite a distinguished visitor. And this is the crazy sequence we didn't plan carefully we had to do. The seniors come in, they get a briefing, and our idea is that the moment that uh, the briefing is happening, uh, we, the attackers are going to break in and shut down the cooling system and the reactor is gonna scram. And we had you know, said not so realistically that the uh, plant is powered by its own nuclear reactor, so the lights are gonna go down. So we've got this complex sequence of event. And in this scenario, uh, the attackers a nation state, they hired a, well, they recruited a local guy presented himself as Greenpeace, saying, you need to go over to this plant to take radio, uh, radioactivity measurements for us. And the guy, well, okay, well, put this in his truck and this laptop at this sensor, but it's not a sensor. It's the Wi-Fi uh, connection to the a Raspberry Pi that was introduced in the networks. And uh, through this and a 4G link, uh, Mike was able to come in over a C2 system on Amazon and then come down the, 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 the uh, 4G network, jump onto the Wi-Fi system, onto the plant, and then be on the Raspberry Pi, execute some code, and have the ICS system shut down. And that Raspberry Pi was put in place by breaking into the physical system, opening the access control, deleting some, well, we didn't delete videos on this one. Uh, the first one I think we did. Stop you stopped the recording when this was put in place. And then, uh, and then the attack happened. But the sequence, they didn't know how long it would take for all these connections because the laptop is calling back. And we're trying to time this with the distinguished visitors. And there's a row of us in the room, you know, sending a thumbs up signal, go for the attack. And we wanted the audio to come in of the alert of the ICS kit. And this kit is downstairs in the basement. So we even had two of my kids' laptop connected with Netcat piping the audio all the way to the top room. Anyways, it's crazy stuff, but it worked like a charm. And I have a few slides on this. So this is when the seniors were being briefed. We had a guy with the breaker, and when the, the whole system went down, he just killed the breaker in the room, and we had this light that turned on automatically, and all the monitors went out. And this is exactly at the moment when we had, the, I think he was the head of the Office of Nuclear Regulation of the UK, asking the participants for the briefing, so he's a senior exec saying, and he just said, is my plant safe? Do you think the hackers are out of the network? And he says, yes, sir, you're totally safe, there's no problem, and just the light went shock right at that moment. <laughs> like, what is this? And this uh, alarm, alarm comes on, warning, warning, that all that. So that was pretty funny. And this is completely unrealistic, okay? That doesn't work this way. But still, it, it really draws them into the scenario and the story, and they all like want to do this work. So then they go off, and we restore electricity. Uh, they start investigating, and here they're looking at the captured video footage, which, of course, we filmed days before, and we're inserting with a script into the video system, because it's not happening live. Picture of somebody at the ICS kit, and then when they look more carefully, you'll see, I get the laser again, here is a Raspberry Pi that's been inserted into the ICS and plugged in. And when they discover this, they kind of say, okay, well, we report it. And we're role playing the security officer and everything. And when we got to designing this part of the scenario, okay, I've got like 12 minutes and I've got two more videos. I'll try to go quickly. We uh, said, what would happen? And we talked to the UK and they, and they said, well, we." You know, if there's a van outside with a, a, a Wi-Fi access point, there's security. So I Google what's security at the UK nuclear power plant. And they have this civil nuclear constabulary force, and which are like SWAT teams and everything. So, okay, we need a SWAT team. So the beauty about Estonia is it's a small country, and you can get anything you want. So I make this phone call, a person I met, I ask her, send an email to a guy. And he uh, ends up being in the police and everything. He says, well, what kind of people do you want? And I say, well, I need the kind of special people. He says, okay, well, go meet this guy. So I show up over there. And this is the SWAT team, you can tell. All the guys are like, Phew. And then there's kit everywhere and everything. I sit down with them. I said, this is the scenario. And a guy doesn't speak too much English. Kind of, oh, what do you want? Well, I want two vehicles. He says, black BMW, X5. Yeah, that's good. And he says, how big the guns? Big guns, small guns? I said, <laughs> Average, average. And he says, is that it? I said, no, I need all of your radio communications. Everything you say on the radio, I want it taped, and I want you to give it to me with the footage. I want head cams and everything, and I want to bring that in. And I said, okay. So then we 
call somebody else and say, I need a, like something that looks like a nuclear power plant. So there's a military base there. We can go, okay, let's go there. Anyways, we get everything set up. We prepare for the filming. And then we film the takedown of this guy sitting in the van. And the problem is, is that the audio is not good. We, the, the SWAT team guys, they just want to go all the time. So I'm there and I'm trying to brief them. And I'm telling them, this is what you need to do. Uh, you need to arrest this guy, do whatever you do as a police force, but you need to ask him to log on to the server, onto the laptop. This was part of our scenario. And I thought, really do that. Ask him, can you log on? And they said, okay, and we just don't have time. It's just going so quickly and everything. So we get set up and everything, and they do all of their thing. Uh, but we don't have it perfectly well on the audio, and they, they're Estonian, but, so they don't speak good British English. So then I have a problem about the audio because you can look at the movie, it's beautiful, but the sound doesn't explain it. So Mike flies in on <laughs> Friday. I invite him over, this is just before the exercise, on Saturday, serve him a few glasses of wine to him and uh, Eve who was on his team. And then I say, guys, I need some help. I got this video, I need some voiceover. And I wrote this script and I get Mike to read the script. And I take my home little radios and I give him one of my radios and I go in my uh, washing machine room and I put my iPhone and I record my end of the radio and I get these two guys to talk to each other to, to you know, do a new voiceover for the script. And then I spend Sunday merging that into the video and then we play it during the week of the exercise. And in essence, this is what it gives. I think this is it. Yeah, so this is the van outside the nuclear power plant. These guys were perfect. And the guy in the van is our sysadmin. We didn't tell him. We didn't tell him anything. Get out of the vehicle. Get out. He said, just come for a movie. It's okay. Don't worry about it. What's your name? What are you doing here? That's it. I did nothing. Right. What's the laptop for? The laptop is taking the Is it yours? No, it's not mine. It's mine. Coffee, get him over here. So this is the part that breaks down. We told him he's got to log in. But we told him, do your police work, which is coffee first. Log in. So the guys were not expecting this at all. And they were like all like, what is this, you know, kind of thing. And after this played, about five minutes later, we gave them the actual laptop that had been used and all the evidence was still on it. And this piece, we didn't realize it. This went so fast. We didn't see that he was asking to log on with this handcuff. It's only after we got back and we're editing the clip, we're like, what is that? <laughs> and so you thought, 
Mike was a great hacker. He's also a great actor for the voiceover. I mean, that voice was perfect. Him and Eve, Eve was also excellent. It was just the greatest. So that was, uh, that was the takedown at the, the end. And it was really, like, really fun to see them all like, see that. And then the laptop, we gave it to them and asked them to do some file carving. And I don't think they ever got to it in the end. But if they file carved on that laptop, they found this that we placed in there. This is a rental document from a nearby airport from the power plant Skegness with a rental, of course, having some name, some credit card information in it, and passport information as well somewhere. Uh, and then in the end, this is all fake because this is uh, you know, uh, rented by the enemy, but still it's information that's useful. And the other thing that's in there was a picture on it. Can you tell me something about, you know, if you find a picture, what can you get as info? Geolocation. So we changed the geotag of this to match to a nearby hotel in Skegness. So now if you found this picture, you looked at the geotag, you get a hotel, you can send the police there, and there might be evidence in the room, fingerprints and things like that. Can you tell me something else about the picture? Look at the picture. So this is the driver that got arrested. He was recruited by the foreign intelligence agent, human on the ground that is recruited and told him, get Greenpeace laptop, go measure radiation. Look here. There's a face reflection on the side of the TV. You have a picture of the guy. And that's the guy who you see on the Avis report right in here. It's not it's clear on some different displays, but his face has a reflection there. So if you carve the hard drive, you get this out, you get a picture of the bad guy, you get a fake passport number, fake credit card number, a flight number, and you can arrest him at the, at the border when he tries to leave the country. All of these details were completely planned, synced up, and created into the environment, prepared it, you know, and then delivered onto the networks everywhere, and then played out live with the attacks, synchronized with all the actions, and that's a real engaging scenario. And the people who go through that, you know, and handle all this, there's a bunch of stuff that makes no sense. The arrest, bringing the van back and everything, doesn't matter. It's just becoming such a great activity that it's, you know, worth a lot more. And these details don't take a lot of time to do. You just got to think about it and, and develop this richness. So we got three minutes left and we did, I've got this video and uh, I've just let it play. Uh, this is what it looks like. This was the gas exercise and we had this fake pipeline that got hacked and uh, flow of gas was stopped, but the readings were saying the gas was flowing. So by the time that uh, uh, they, they were running out of gas, people were complaining, then they had to see, no, the pipeline's fine. No, actually it's half empty and it'll take two days to fill up. And they do the, all the analysis. But the images just give you a feeling for how we set things up in the office. And we build all of these displays and everything so that they have this workstations to, to do the work and do the analysis, plan things out, working as a team with people coming in and out of, of the rooms where we place each team. I'll skip ahead. There's another exercise we did, and I'll finish with this video, I promise. Uh, we're about completely done now. Uh, was the financial sector exercise. And then again, we delivered it twice. Uh, first time, 24, then 30 participants organized in four or five teams. Each is a stock of a financial institution. And we created this, this IT environment with banking operations. We actually build a cardboard version of a bank's uh, reserve management system that implements the SWIFT protocol and does the messaging. And we work with the domain experts to actually know how that works. What are the roles, what people do, how do you move money around? And then we had also a little bit of a, they wanted some ICS system to control the heating and cooling of the data center. And we included in this one also, again, a simulated law enforcement engagement. So we had uh, Interpol on the case, and when they started, they already had video surveillance of uh, the hackers at their, at their site. And they, we started and gave them more and more information and engaged them with law enforcement. Completely unrealistic, just there to you know, entertain and keep, keep the stuff going. I got this uh, call there. I think we're done, it's a coffee break, so if you wanna go, you can go. This video is about two minutes, and I think the other one is six minutes. So this is the guy that plays the case officer in, uh, in Interpol. And we have this lady that's in Estonia, who's the case officer. We have been on this case 
for the past couple of weeks. We are certain by now that uh, the operations that the suspects are conducting are criminal. However, we need more evidence in order to secure their conviction. So now I have managed to get access to a short uh, video uh, that we have managed to record in their operational base. And I'd be happy to share it with you. So we did this in the basement of a Ministry of Defense so building which we set up at this room as the hacker's lair. Conducting their business. And you can see that they have their own security, cameras from our own security camera. camera there. And you can see that they also have their own surveillance in action. One and they're the coming in you now. You can see there shows outside, and the other uh, shows the corridor. And the suspects are actually entering as we speak. Again, the our sysadmins. Then Ragnar Ramos and the third Yanis Valoris. Sorry. You can see that Victor is armed. He just uh, put uh, down his gun next to his computer. And we can see that they are in action. They are just in the middle of, of conducting an operation. And uh, from the second angle, you can see more precisely what they're doing. But unfortunately, we cannot see what they're typing or we cannot really uh, see the text. However, we have pretty good audio, uh, so we can hear what they're saying, and they keep on repeating the term MP software. So, so we placed hints of what they need to look at inside the network. MP software is our banking up software we, we wrote. Um, any more information right now, but um, I'm, I'm looking forward to... So this is a way to engage them into the story, to give them hints of what to look at. Now the hint of MP software. Then they went on in that direction, started to look at that. There was a supply chain vulnerability. The, the company got hacked. Uh, software came in with a vulnerability that would hide certain payments. And then they went in and did those payments, and the system actually hid the payments. They couldn't tell. So we, they, the hackers stole, you know, uh, in the end, many, many millions of, uh, of euros out of the bank. And that went unnoticed for quite a while. I'm showing you this because this is the part that we engage them with, keeps them interested into the scenario. I have one more, and I think that's pretty much it with the takeaways after. And this is the end of it when we're reaching the climax, and this is where we only again painted ourselves in a corner and having 20 seconds to do an attack again. And this is the final sequence of that exercise. And this guy is simulating Interpol. Background is actually the 911 room in Estonia. 112. Anna has been informed that she's going to meet the Estonian police near the site. She'll be there for the rest and start doing the forensics immediately. The key thing for us is the element of surprise. We don't want them to have the chance to erase the data. In particular, we don't want them to put a switch on the wall that will kill the power of the main server and be screwed if they do that. This is what Anna really wants. She's been dying to get her hands on that data for weeks. On the surveillance, we saw that they don't have the rifle today. They packed light, so we're lucky. It's clear that this is their last visit to the site. And again, we got the K commandos from Estonia to come and do this. This is the real police SWAT team for but Estonia. We need all five of you to confirm when we see them in the networks. The more banks we, we see them in, the better. We'll this is when Mike is going, going to do the attack so at the exact the moment the guys are in the room typing, and this attack, they've been set up with a, a snort alert that will trigger when the packets fly by and we're there simulating having the call with these guys and then yeah we see the attack and then when all of the calls come in then they decide to go because we they caught the hackers red-handed into the networks so we come back to this setup here he just called asking to join him he pretty stressed I guess there's one last thing they need to do before they leave I'm going to call Anna and tell her to get ready. So these are all sequences we had to film and put together. And we don't always plan it well. So some are pretty rough a bit. But uh, they kind of work. Hey, time to go. Yeah, you need to. There's a soundtrack that's not coming in. No. See people entering the building on the surveillance system there. Ah, there's the mouse and Manny now. Looks like they're discussing something. And I see Manny is securing the door. Below 
artist is reaching for something here. Uh-huh, we're splitting the cash. I'm calling Anna now. We printed fake bills. <laughs> this is fun to do. Gearing up right now. Throwing it. All right. Shit, she beat me to the punch. They're getting ready to go into the SWAT team now. I need you guys to keep a lookout on the network traffic so we can give them the signal. So now at this point is the point where Mike is actually pressing, you know, enter and doing all of the bank transactions through his back doors into the network, which causes one of the alerts on, on, the, on the IOC on this to trigger. And then they're all calling in. So it took us a while to build that room and film everything, but we do that two weeks in advance, and then we can't control the footage anymore. We have to work with what we've got. We're here in the car, ready to go. Just waiting for your signal. Time to go. And go now. This time they dressed up the usual way they do, and they did their tactics. So this is not realistic. They wouldn't do it this way. They told us how she they would do it, in. but you know, a little bit of Hollywood. There, You'll see them coming class. here. This and this the computer is the server with the data, and that's the power switch. There's and if you kill that power switch, you lose the, the encrypted data. And in this one, I wanted a bit more action than the first one. So this door, Looks like they're now. we built in there so they could break into it. And they're coming out. They dismounted the vehicles, approaching the door. We should be getting their head cam video and audio here pretty shortly. Ah, there we go. Right. They're getting ready to breach. They'll definitely be using their flashbangs for sure. This is the crazy thing that the cops asked to use flash grenades. It wasn't our idea. I'm inside the Ministry of Defense building barely have permissions to be there, built my own door, and then cops come in with all their gear and are asking to use flash grenades. And you never say no to a cop, so okay, I guess. And this is the bit about the story that uh, wanted some bit of action in there. No, not the switch, don't let him hit the switch. <laughs> <laughs> And that was our. That was our sysadmin. And uh, you know we practiced this, and we only had one shot with the door, so that was the final shot. But we filmed this 12 times, and they threw like three. Uh, you can stop it. Uh, they uh, they threw in three flash grenades. They're the real stuff. They 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 asked for this, and I'm like, are you? Can you? And then they they said, yeah, sure, no worries. And then they taped up the smoke detectors because that would trigger the building fire alarm and everything. I'm like, what are we doing here? Anyways, they had to film it 12 times, and then they uh, one of the our guys wanted to resist on the first time, so he did that, and he didn't do it on the next scenes. Anyways, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> that was the I guess the takeaways. Very quickly, Mike, if you let me, uh, make them custom. They need to meet your client's specific need. For this, you need domain knowledge. You don't have that. Hire, and then you bring in that uh, knowledge. The richness and the realism of the technical and operational needs to be absolutely perfect. Uh, and you need to provide your team with very good blue team tools, because there's not a lot of time. And the, the whole um, uh, simulation uh, of the end user and system and didn't talk too much about that. That has to be very responsive. And then you also can get them to talk to senior management under pressure. That's a good thing. And this realism is important. This scenario being engaging really makes them want to do the work. Is that realistic? Not at all. But it really helped. And every time we ask them, do you like this stuff? Is it good? And they always say yes. So this has been a success for us. So I guess that's all I have. I'm really sorry about the, you know, taking too long. Thank you.